Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Myra Bridgeforth, and I am a, the co-creator, along with Ann Mugler, of the Crooked Steeple Literary Festival. And we're so happy to be at our final event of this year. And um, we're so glad you're here on this Saturday to hear stories and to be inspired and to meet some people who care about books like you do. Um, this is the last in our series of, for this year, and we're really happy you're here. Amazingly, our next season is already set. So we're very excited that that's, we'll have another year of it. Um, look around and see the friendly looking people that have on white shirts and bandanas. Um, they are greeters and helpers, and they're ready to point you to where the bathroom is and to answer your questions. If you didn't get a three by five card, um, that you, if you want to write it down a question, you have to have the three by five card and you have to write it down. And then you can just wave at, at one of those people and they'll take the card from you. Um, and at the end, our speaker will answer some of the questions depending on how much time we have. Um, Bard's Alley Bookshop in Vienna is our bookseller partner for the festival and we are honored to have their help and support. If you haven't visited Bard's Alley in, on Church Street in Vienna, please check it out. I live in Vienna, and trust me and I, when I tell you that it is, I mean, independent bookstores are just so cool, and this is a cool one, and it's just a wonderful way to spend an afternoon, so check them out. Um, Amy from Bard's Alley is here to sell books, and Amy, thank you. Um, you can purchase a copy of the newly released paperback of The Great Displacement, and after the interview, you can get your book signed by the author. We first heard of Jake Biddle through our friend Gail Warner, who sent me an email telling me about her colleague who talked about this book and had been nominated for some prize, and her colleague is Jake's mom. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's really great. I don't know about you mothers out there, but when one of my children writes a book, I'm going to be talking it up. Um, just you wait. It's, it'll happen. So on the force of my friend Gail Warner and Jake's mother, and the title of the book, which is tells you what the book's about, I always love that, um, and some prize, I ordered the book and read it. And the prize turned out to be the 2024 Carnegie Mellon for Excellence. And this book was on the short list. I was moved by the stories that he tells and the places he describes. Anne and I immediately knew that this was an important book and we wanted to share it with all of you. Mr. Biddle is a journalist who writes about climate change and energy. He lives in Brooklyn and is a contributing writer for Grist. His work also has also appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and Harper's Magazine. He grew up in Florida, and his parents now live in Falls Church, which is pretty much how we got him. <laughs> Ann Mugler is going to do the interview for today. Anne is very well known to many of you. She is my co-creator for the, the Crooked Steeple Literary Festival and our first presenter in the series in November 22 with her poetry book, Additional Pop Possibilities for the Ark. She is a halfway retired psychotherapist, beautiful poet, talented rug hooker, mother of two grown sons, and most importantly, grandmother to Owen. Here at FCPC, she is the chair of the spiritual growth team that first championed our festival and the creative force and frequent storyteller for Godly Play Ministry. Many generations of, ch of young children learned Bible stories in a remarkably creative way from listening to and watching Anne tell the stories. Please join me in, in welcoming Jake Biddle and Ann Mugler to the Crooked Steeple stage. That's so they can see you. <laughs> I don't know what it's like up there. 
Welcome, Jake. So glad that you're here. Thanks so much for having me. It's on, it's on right? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with um, a question about the book uh, title. Your book takes us from Florida all the way to North Carolina, over to California, then to Louisiana, back to Houston, and finally Norfolk, Virginia. The title is The Great Displacement, Climate Change, and the Next American Migration. Tell us why you chose that title. Yeah, I think when I, uh, oh, I'll move it back a little bit. Uh, <laughs> when I started working on the book, I was mostly writing about housing, and I wanted to write about uh, the intersection of housing and climate change and places in the United States where people were being uh, moved from their, uh, sort of uh, forced out of their homes by climate disasters. And at the time, there was like an emerging conversation about what people called climate migration, right? Especially people talk about many people from the developing world ending up in Europe or the United States uh, owing to famine or floods. And I kind of wanted to... Um, I know, like provide a kind of corrective to that conversation because the movement that I was trying to describe was, it wasn't one directional, it wasn't um, you know, voluntary in the way that we tend to think of migration as being. It was very chaotic, it was multi-directional, people would leave their homes and return or they would move twice or three times or uh, they would, sometimes they wouldn't move at all or they would move just down the street. And it was just sort of like a, a churn almost of, of uh, sort of chaotic movement. And I thought that displacement which is kind of a ubiquitous word in housing studies when people talk about eviction or things like that, uh, would be like a better sort of framing device for mm -hmm. um, the conversation about climate change and housing than migration, right? So it's sort of like a, an attempt to ground uh, the conversation about climate change and housing in like the, the actual sort of frenzied and chaotic nature of the movement that I was seeing when I would talk to people who had lived through hurricanes and fires mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, it seems that when a climate disaster occurs, the ensuing chaos, as you were just describing, um, involves not only the folks that experience the disaster, but many people and systems, like in housing and insurance, etc. Can you speak to that? Right, yeah. I think it, it goes back to what I was saying before, that we tend to think of migration as like a, a psychological question, right? Like, are you going to stay or are you going to leave? You know, you know that the sea levels are rising, so are you going to hold on in Florida or decide to go to North Carolina or something like that? And what I was kind of observing, and again, I think it was because I had spent so much time writing about housing displacement and homelessness was that it was really a question of people's position within the mortgage market and the insurance market and also just the sort of like individual dynamics of their subdivision or whatever, right? So if they were renters versus if they had, you know, a lot of equity in their homes and if they had purchased, you know, substantial insurance coverage or if they hadn't or even just like what their neighbors were doing, right? Like if everyone else left, you know, there's a uh, the city might not, you know, invest as much in the garbage route, right? Because there's like so few people there. Or if people leave the town, the tax base decreases. There were all these sort of almost material forces and economic dynamics that, that sort of combined to influence people's decisions. So what looked like a kind of, again, like a binary choice of staying or leaving, uh, actually some sort of like complicated calculus of what's everyone else around me doing, you know, how much insurance did I have, did I pay off my home, et cetera, et cetera. And every person's movement through, you know, Houston or Florida after a storm was a result of that sort of calculus, like acting on them, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you talk really sympathetically uh, about that and, and that people always get to ask the question, you know, why don't you just leave? Why don't right. you just pack up and go? Yeah. And um, it's not that simple. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the first uh, sort of, it's not so much in the book, but one of the first like historical cases that I looked at was Hurricane Katrina, where in, you know, Dennis Hastert, who was the Speaker of the House at the time, got on the floor of the House and said, you know, we should not rebuild New Orleans. You know, we should not give them money to rebuild because it's too vulnerable. And this is like kind of a, I mean, it's really noxious kind of thing to say, but it, it captures a kind of like view that people have of these vulnerable places of like, you know, if everyone were rational, 
they would just leave. And it, there's sort of two things. One, for, for many people, it's rational to stay because they can't afford the, the cost of moving. They don't really know where they would go, their house, their family. It's, it's, but, but also, there's a kind of irrational thing that we should also respect, which is that people belong in these places and they have deep you know, history and culture and in many places, like go back centuries in these places. And it's not as simple as just saying, get out, it's too risky, right? So yeah, that was a, another kind of, even though the book's about people who move, I was kind of also trying to show that like, when this happens, it's not as simple as people just acting on a kind of rational assessment of risk, right? There's a, a really complex process of loss and grieving that goes on when, when mm -hmm. this movement occurs. You know, I think you wrote right well about justice always being involved in climate change. Um, often poor folks end up in vulnerable lands like floodplains, the lands that are not wanted by the more affluent. Um, how do you see this operating both in the past and in the present? Yeah, I think, I mean, in the past, you know, most places that I would go, the built environment, you know, had emerged in the, the late 19th and through the middle of the 20th century at a time when, you know, racial covenants were like in effect, like almost all fire insurance was coded based on race. And so, like, for instance, in Princeville, uh, which was the one of the oldest towns founded by African-Americans in the U.S. So right after the Civil War, it was founded on the plantation land that actually was too flood prone to even grow cotton or wheat on. So the freedmen who showed up, the, they bought it from the, the plantation owner for like, you know, what's now the equivalent of like eight cents or something because it was useless, right? So from the very beginning, they were living in a place that really wasn't safe for human beings to inhabit. And through a mixture of like luck and resilience, they toughed it out for now almost 200 years. But um, in the present, it's still true, right? Like the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans was like, it was, it was kind of built to flood. And even in places like uh, California, like the, the cheapest land, you know, where people can live in like camper vans and stuff is in the mountains. It's in these extremely fire prone places. So you still see, I think when you have a housing market that's kind of like vicious and I mean, it's regulated, but in many ways it's left to kind of like the, the whims of the free market. And then you have like cities that were built and designed by people who don't really tend to, sh like, they were designed before the passage of the Civil Rights Act or before, you know, segregation was outlawed. Uh, you're going to end up with the worst land mm -hmm. uh, happening to be, you know, tending to be where uh, the, the poorest and worst off people live. And that's like, it's just true over and over again. Um, and sometimes it's just by chance, but then other times you can see a kind of like, kind of vicious like design in it. Um, and we're still living in those places now. Mm. So it's clear from your book and other articles um, that we are living with daily facts, some irreversible. The ocean temperatures are rising, the coral reefs are dying, sea levels risen six inches in 10 years, and there are 17 named, already named tropical storms suspected in 2024. Even the economist Paul Krugman wrote in the New York Times about the septic tank nightmare this isn't funny, but ending, ending the piece with this sentence, bad stuff is coming and we are already starting to smell it. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think climate change can be seriously halted or adapted under this economic system that we have? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question that um, we could probably spend this entire time talking about, or like the rest of our lives probably. But um, I mean, you know, I think that in the last 10 years, I mean, you know, when you, 10 years ago, if we had been having this conversation, I think we would have said that the, 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 the like market in America was showing almost no signs of, of taking climate change seriously. Like, you know, coal consumption had fallen, but there was really very little growth in green energy, et cetera. And in the last 10 years, owing to a bunch of things, you know, mostly the cost of batteries and solar panels has fallen a lot, the cost of building them. Uh, lithium has become like much easier to obtain. There's been a, a huge growth in, in wind and solar power and in electric vehicles. And there's also been just an enormous amount of, of both public and private money flowing into research for decarbonizing things like cement, which is extremely dirty, and finding alternate sources of fuel. So it's sort of starting to become 
at least possible to say that the current economic system is at least taking the problem seriously, right? And if you look at a bunch of the projections, you could see the world's warmed by about like 1.1 or 1.2, depending on the day, <laughs> uh, degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. And, you know, probably two is maybe the most that you'd want it to but before things got really, really, really bad. And, uh, you know, the range of predictions for the middle of the century, for, it would plateau maybe at like 1.5, between 1.5 and 2.5. Mm. So there's a range of outcomes there just based on what's already been done and what's already been set in motion with, you know, electric vehicles, with like all the subsidies for clean energy, you know, sustainable aviation. We could talk about, you know, any number of these things. And it's really unclear whether we'll end up on the 1.5 side or the 2.5 side, how much more ambitious governments will be in the future, you know, whether the current uh, private investment in those green energy technologies will continue. Um, but I think like, I mean, I don't want to say I don't know, um, because everyone came to hear me <laughs> answer the question, but, but uh, you know, it's just really, uh, there, it, it, the range of outcomes is between, like, whew, and, you know, oh, no, we're really verging on, you know, like, a, a kind of, a kind of calamity that's really difficult to, for, it's actually difficult to even understand what it would be like because there's just no precedent for, you know, something like two, two and a half degrees of warming. We don't really know what would happen. And a lot of things could spiral out of control. So I think that, like, the right answer is, like, we're, the, the economic system we have is, is actually trying for, like, a, in the last 10 years for a lot of reasons that coincided quite conveniently and also because of, like, pretty significant action by a lot of governments, including our own and those in Europe. Um, but it is a lot of work left to do, and I don't know whether the, you know, the, the political system in the United States and Europe is going to be able to get us to the finish line, like the best possible outcome of 1.5, or whether, you know, things will kind of keep sort of spiraling out of control despite the efforts that we've made. So that's a long answer, but um, yeah. it's a really good question. It's hard. So getting a little smaller, yeah. um, <laughs> what's the best way to handle relief for folks in a disaster crisis? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then I'm going to double all down on this. <laughs> what should FEMA do first, and mm -hmm. why is it under Homeland Security? Oh, why is it under Homeland Security? <laughs> well, I, uh, I, you'd have to ask uh, Bush <laughs> Jr., right? I mean, I don't know. He, I mean, I don't, it, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that at the time that they were reor that they were organizing DHS, right? All the the potential thoughts were like um, it was all about terrorism, right? And that mm -hmm. was that was how they were conceiving of like risk to the United States. And actually, really interestingly, like at the I, they passed like a terrorism reinsurance act that made the United States like a, a liable backstop for any big terrorist attack in the future. So that's the kind of thing that people are saying that they should do now for big climate disasters. They actually have already done it with TRIA, the Terrorism Reinsurance Act. Um, sorry, that's kind of a tangent. But so FEMA, like, they're a little shorthanded, obviously. They don't have enough money. But um, I think there's been too much emphasis on basically getting aid after disaster is sort of like filing like a health insurance claim or something like you have to show the damage and then they process it and they'll come back and say okay we're adjusting it down here now here's your money and they have uh, the the uh, Dan Criswell who's appointed by Biden has actually like in the last couple months actually since I wrote the book um, not because I wrote the book, but it's not in the book. She's changed a lot of this. Like, they've decided to, they'll give you like $1,200 cash without really any questions asked uh, for housing aid. There's gotta be a focus on like, it's gonna be like direct cash aid for people immediately as fast as you possibly can. And then, not only that, which they don't really do right now, but they have to stick around for a long time. You know, like the, 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 the the housing stipend that you get from FEMA, it expires after 18 months. That's as long as you can be paid to stay in a hotel if you get your home destroyed in a hurricane or something. And that's just not enough time right now because it's just building materials are so expensive and the storms are so strong. You know, the recovery time for a hurricane is like five years now. So they just don't have enough invested. And again, this has also started to change a little bit, but um, they don't have enough investment in the long term. It's just a really difficult, it's a whole community process, recovering from a storm, and I think for too long they've treated it as um, basically individual aid claims that are quite, they're really burdensome to do. I mean, people are like, I don't know how many times I've talked to this one, it's like, I'm in my car, I don't have 
really sell service, like I don't know where to go, I'm, I have like a one gallon water jug, and in order to get money from FEMA, you have to upload like a PDF of your like deed to your home to a website, like, and they do this on their phones, like it's just like, it's just miserable, and so they've, yeah. they've made real progress on this, um, probably because the media, I mean, they've, she told me, like she was like, the media just hammers us so hard on this, is that they've started to change it, but, um, but it, there's still like a long way to mm. go, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. we already have a housing crisis in this country, and you've written in your book that housing is, is and will be one of the biggest consequences to climate disaster. Climate refugees should have the inalienable rights of housing, clean water, food, clothing, yet there is a possibility that we will end up with climate gentrification. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a really difficult thing because if you look at places that have received a lot of people after disasters, right? Like in Louisiana, a lot of people have moved from the really the, the most vulnerable sections of the coastline into cities like on the North Shore of like Pontchartrain and like a little bit farther inland. And those towns, they don't have the um, housing stock, they don't have the tax the revenue to sustain a huge influx of people. And so you get housing values go up, right? And there's a shortage of apartments and everyone gets mad, right? And like, this is a big thing after Katrina in New Orleans or in Houston, where a bunch of people went, like you couldn't get a call back for a job if you have 504 area code because there was so much suspicion. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have a process of like resource scarcity in the places that are safe, or relatively safe, mm -hmm. right? So there's a rush for, you know, the, the, the exits and all of a sudden people end up in, and this is like, a, you know, there's been plenty of people who've discussed like, okay, where's a really safe place to go in the future? You could, there's a guy at Harvard who's made this campaign called like Climate Proof Duluth, and it's like <laughs> Duluth, Minnesota, is like, <laughs> it's really, really cold there, so, and they have a lot of fresh water, uh, and they get a lot every year in the form of snow, uh, and, and uh, he's basically like, this could be, and people in Duluth, the mayor loves this, obviously, but that, the rest, they hate it. You know, they're like, don't tell everyone, you know, don't tell everyone to come here. We don't have enough space for them. Um, so it's a real problem. It's, it's funny now, but I think, you know, in 50 years, you could see like a real issue of, just like in, you know, Austin, Texas right now, or Boise, Idaho, where people from California are leaving and they're ending up there. It's a, it's a huge problem. Like they're just jack up the housing prices so much. So it doesn't look like traditional gentrification, right? Where, uh, you know, kind of like dilapidated store gets turned into like a, a, a new wave coffee shop, but it is kind of like a process of, of redevelopment and, and cost increases that can be, it, or can and probably will be pretty difficult for like the incumbent residents of those places. Well, yeah. 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 So who is addressing climate change well? Mm -hmm. Like adaption strategies or yeah. resilience or yeah. Can we retreat. Yeah, I was really impressed. Um, I was really impressed by the city of Norfolk, Virginia. I mean, they are facing a sort of almost like a triple vulnerability from like sea level rise. Like there's routine flooding on rivers. Also, the stormwater system's in trouble. And of course, they're on the coast, so they can get hit by hurricanes as well. Um, but you know, many streets like it floods every day. And and they they came up with this really novel. There's a huge question of, all right, we have like a, a billions of dollars of real estate sitting here and people don't really want to leave. So how can we encourage without, you know, using eminent domain or something, how can we encourage people to move to safer places? And they came up with this, this is just like one example, but they came up with this really novel structure where if a developer wants to build some something somewhere in the city, they have to, uh, this isn't in effect yet, but it probably will be soon. They have to purchase a flood prone home from somebody who lives in a, a really, really vulnerable area, then rent that home back to the homeowner, who I mean, the homeowner has to consent, of course. Um, they, then they rent the home back to the homeowner until that person passes away or decides to leave. When that person leaves, the developer, rather than selling the home to someone else, is obligated to destroy it and turn it into a wetland. Mm -hmm. So this is like, it's sort of like a pay to play thing for the developers who obviously still want to build in the relatively safe parts of the city. If you want to do that, you have to grease the wheels for, um, and so it's at zero cost to the city because all the developer money and developers are used to paying impact fees or whatever when they develop housing. So it's actually not, you know, a, a, an insane demand. So this is like a, this is the kind of like, it's really creative thinking. It wasn't the city that came up with it. It was this guy named Skip Stiles. It, uh, he's like a nonprofit guy there. And it's just the kind of thing I think that we're going to have to do a lot more of. 
because it's just you can't just build a wall you know yeah. in front of the water and hope it works like you have to find ways like novel sort of policies and financing structures and that was a really Im impressive to me I thought mm -hmm. I was kind of blown away by it because so many cities in the United States are dealing with this exact problem and they're all like, <laughs> like flailing their arms and, and you actually <laughs> found a way to kind of like do it for for very little cost which is impressive so is money being thrown at those kind oh, of good yeah. projects yeah I mean so FEMA has a program that was created by the in 2021 infrastructure law called BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. Um, and they've, I mean, it's maybe like $5 billion in the last three years, which is very little compared to the need, but it's way more than we've ever spent on this. And it's, I mean, it's funded hundreds of the most fascinating things like living shorelines along the eastern seaboard and, you know, fire resilient housing and trees in Portland for future heat waves. And it's kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall right now. It's like we just don't know what works because mm -hmm. there's very little um, comprehensive research on what's an effective solution. But for the first time, we're, you know, it's kind of like we're in kindergarten on it, but we're like we're trying. Right. And so I think in 10 years, you'll know a lot more about what the most cost effective and long term like sort of durable solutions to these hazards are and hopefully then there'll be you know appetite in congress to throw you know really significant sums of money at it to make them like general solutions basically so has the um the inflation reduction act helped yeah so they they were kind of they kind of split the money between those two bills and most of the adaptation money got put into the infrastructure bill for like complex reasons relating to joe mansion's like what he thought each of the relative merits of each provision were. Um, and the Inflation Reduction Act has far more money for um, like energy subsidies, right? Like, mm -hmm. you, you know, tax credit for solar panel and tax credit for electric car, home weatherization, and electrification, and, you know, a, a, a tons more stuff uh, like climate smart agriculture. But they sort of did the, they put all the acting on climate change, stopping carbon emission stuff into the Inflation Reduction Act. And they put the, I mean, it's like both bills are kind of misnomers, so it's always really annoying to talk about them. The Inflation Reduction Act is reducing the inflation of global temperatures, and uh, the infrastructure bill is all the adaptation stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But they're, you know, they're one and the same in a way. Yeah. So um, I was reading about some alternative forms of yeah. energy. Right. Um, and then I got in the, spiral of the internet down to Terra Power, which mm -hmm. is Bill Gates' right. big um, Like a nuclear, deal. yeah, right. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yes, I mean, this is like one of the most kind of vexing problems with stopping climate change is solar and wind, like I was saying, are really cheap now, and they're in many places like the cheapest cost of electricity by far is to put solar, but they are not um, because the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing, it's very difficult to replace the entire uh, fossil fuel energy load with them, right? Because like most power that we get, you know, it's come from either coal or natural gas, and those can go all day, all night, and you never have to worry about them shutting down because, the sun, I mean, sometimes they break, of course. But there's a, it's really difficult to figure out how do you replace that maybe last like 15 or 20 percent of energy that you need all the time. 24 seven. So one solution is what he's doing, which is like nuclear power, right? Which we have in this country. We've had it for decades, but he's trying to do a more flexible sort of smaller scale nuclear reactor that, you know, is probably safe, safer. It uses like spent fuel to create the power. So there's less of a waste issue, but there's other solutions too. Like we we've, we've basically have like giant batteries now. Like we have like just really, really, really big batteries that can store you know, a Los Angeles is worth of energy for like two hours or something. Mm -hmm. Those are not ready for prime time, really, but they are getting there. So that's one other option if you're not comfortable with nuclear. Um, but I think, you know, that the, the, all, the whole point of it is figuring out how do you get rid of, right now, the, you know, the, the most, you know, great energy systems in this country, like the, the cleanest energy is like in California, for instance, like solar and wind and hydropower. And then, we don't really like to talk about it, but there's natural gas, like to, to sort of get over the finish line of mm -hmm. what you need and how do you replace that? That's what he's trying to do. And it's, it's a difficult problem, but uh, it's sort of seems like one potential solution is this like more lightweight, if you will, nuclear mm -hmm. reactors that are less bulky than the ones that we have, have had for a long time in yeah. the United States. Yeah. Um, 
So here we are in Virginia. Um, I've lost my Virginia card. <laughs> so, you know, are we in an area of danger? I mean, we live a little bit above the Mason-Dixon line. We have the Potomac River. We have tributaries of that running through our backyards. Uh, we had, we did have a hurricane in 2003 and a derecho not far after that. Are we in danger of flooding? Badly? Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> almost any, you know, riverine ecosystem in the United States is, or really in the world, is of, is of some risk of flooding. If you live near water and you live in a place that's like mapped by FEMA as a flood zone, um, or even if you don't, uh, there's, there's some flood risk. And, you know, the right state, it's not too far from the Atlantic Ocean here. So there's some hurricane risk as well. And also storm water systems. I mean, no matter where you are, uh, precipitation in general, like cloudburst storms have become more intense. You can get, you know, five inches of rain in an hour or something. And, you know, almost no stormwater system in the United States can handle that. So the drains overflow, even if you're not near a river, the streets flood. And we've all seen it happen. Like when you're going underneath an underpass or a railroad viaduct, it's like full of water. Um, and that can happen anywhere. But I think like, if you're looking at the scale of the United States, there's some places, and they're the ones that I was writing about, that face like a, a really existential risk, where it's not just a matter of finding the money to upgrade the drains and you know maybe moving some of the worst designed subdivisions out of the flood zone and maybe like you know being smart about where you build. That's probably more what it looks like for for Northern Virginia, Arlington County, Falls Church, but there's other places that are you know, there's, there truly, there's a truly a question about the, what it looks like for that place to survive. Mm -hmm. So the good news is like, it's not like that here, but, um, <laughs> but you know, that's not to say that there's no risk and there's, there's risk everywhere. You know mm -hmm. I mean? It's just, there's no place that's immune to all disasters. It's like, you know, particularly like a heat wave or something. Like, I think that it was really jarring for a lot of people in the Pacific Northwest in 2021, the, the deadliest heat wave in decades was in Seattle and Portland and yeah. people, they realize, okay, we're not immune from this, but you're not going to have it anywhere. Um, but it could be a lot worse could be. than yeah. it is here. Um, how can we keep our hopes up? <laughs> I mean, yeah. what, what, what can we do about climate change um, from where we sit? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think like there's been a lot of um, really intelligent uh, debate or even like dispute among climate experts and people who care about it over the past 10 or so years about whether what the role of an individual is right because as many of you maybe know like the idea of the carbon footprint was created by BP or I actually it was an ad agency that BP paid um, to to take the focus off of like legislative you know action on fossil fuels um, and to show, okay, maybe we should recycle or carpool, et cetera. It's tough though, because those things actually do help just in a very, very, very small degree. So I think like, you know, if you want to split the difference, it really matters like um, local politics seem to matter a lot. Like I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who live in Michigan or Indiana or Iowa and a power company wants to build like a wind farm in their town, but the the city council or whatever gets a bunch of complaints from people who are concerned about property values, um, which is you know potentially even actually a valid concern. But you know, okay, you know it's like five percent off the property values maybe, or you know we get wind and we decarbonize the whole region. So, so and then the county support of supervisors or whatever will pass an ordinance saying. No wind here ever. You know, we are not going to ever. You're not allowed to cite wind in our county. And the wind company is thinking like, shoot, like you know, we were supposed to put a transmission line that goes straight, and now we have to put it around this county. So it really matters. You know, it's millions and millions of dollars. But that's those people are elected by you know a margin of like 1,000 votes to 800 votes, right? There's very few people mm -hmm. in that county, and this there's like dozens of examples of this. So I think like even here. Um, I and mean, without wanting to comment on the politics of false church, which I should say that I know very little about, like, um, you know, like there are opportunities for local governments to make smart decisions. And I just think it's sometimes it's tough to just say, like, vote, because 
it's not really a satisfactory answer. And you know, people also are wondering, like, if I recycle, does it make a difference? I do think that engagement in the ways that climate change becomes a local question, which are numerous, um, specifically with regard to permitting for, you know, oh, it's a house that's being built in, like a housing development being built in a flood zone, or how, how do we want the city to spend money on storm drains, et cetera, or should we build a solar flood? That's, those tend to, you know, they add yeah. up, right? Yeah. And we might not see it add up, right? Like you're never gonna see a ledger of, you know, how we got to 1.5 degrees Celsius and your name is not gonna appear in the, you know, but <laughs> thank you, you know, but, uh, but it's still, it still helps, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I guess this is a, a, a question that speaks to that. What's going to happen to DC, particularly Foggy Bottom? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, DC has gotten a ton of money from brick from these FEMA programs, I think, because the city of Washington has applied for them pretty strongly. They have a huge stormwater problem there. The mm -hmm. drains are terrible in most of DC, especially Southeast. Um, and they really have to spend a lot of money, and they, as you know, DC doesn't have a ton of money, um, to fix it. And it's gonna be really, like there's a lot of residential neighborhoods in DC that have really, really awful flooding problems. And I think it's gonna take a long time because like, it's just really hard for them to pursue a comprehensive plan to fix that. But they'll, they'll, they're starting, right? Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of the climate solution for places like Washington will look like It'll just look like sort of quality of life improvements for individual neighborhoods that you might not really like ever notice it, even living as close as you do. But it will, over time, hopefully reduce the future you know, burden of, of flooding in, mm -hmm. in those places. Um, but it's not easy because fixing a drain is like, it's really expensive. Like you have to get underground and, it, and also everyone hates it when they tear up the street, but it's, it's really time consuming, expensive and, and these, they were just weren't built for anything like the climate that we have now. It's really tough, yeah. So we, we might or hope for uh, a lot of construction going on the streets of yeah Let's next see. time yeah next time you next time stop you're, being mad about next time it. you're complaining right. yeah may, maybe you might be watching the no <laughs> you're still allowed to complain about it in my opinion um here's another question um you mentioned in the book nebraska or midwest as a reprieve for sea level rise mm -hmm. but what about tornadoes oh yeah this is a this is actually becoming a big i went to um like an insurance conference the other week and the, I was expecting the insurers to be freaked out about hurricanes and wildfires because I've written so much about fire insurance and flood insurance, but they were all talking about tornadoes and they were like, you know, this guy from Swiss Re, this big reinsurance company was like pulling his hair out about how there were so many more tornadoes in, in Alabama and Mississippi now. So it's, the science is not quite as strong. Like we just don't have quite as much evidence, but there's some indication that you know, first of all, the risk has increased a lot. Like, there's just a lot more property values in the, the areas where these storms tend to happen now, just because of, like, just natural human development over the last couple of decades in those places. But also the range of Tornado Alley, if you will, has shifted somewhat, so that a lot of places like Alabama, even northern Florida, they're seeing quite a bit of tornado activity that they never did before. And then even other places, there's, like, uh, this phrase that I keep hearing, grapefruit-sized hail, that apparently, I mean, we still don't know, but there's some indication that these storms are forming really fast and they move really fast and they drop like crazy hail. Um, so yeah, there's, like I was saying before, there's significant risk basically everywhere. The plus side though, is that the tornado band, as it shifts south and east, actually there should be a reprieve for the places where like, Dorothy was from, you know, like <laughs> Kansas. Actually, they should see a reduction, but it will take a while, but, the, you know, but there should be, I mean, those places will always have tornadoes, but uh -huh. it actually should be, it's probably worse than the Southeast now, uh, or it will be compared to those sort of traditional okay. places. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, she was from Kansas, not Nebraska. I know. Cause she, well, yeah, right? yeah. I forgot. Well, right. Um, so, um, do we have questions from the audience?
just like Johnny Carson. Yeah. Right. Like thinking, uh, what should we do next? Right. <laughs> the, okay. the turban. I can't read these very well, so you're just going to have to look at them real quick. Okay. Okay, okay cool. Oh, okay, this is interesting. Are there people taking advantage of the fear of climate change to profit without thinking of the good of others, oh. i.e. selfishly or criminally? That's a really good question. I think that there are, I was like astonished when I went to, I was in Louisiana after Hurricane Ida in 2021, and I was astonished by the number of truly bad actors in the immediate aftermath of they, you know, these like really shady contractors and um, they show up and they promise you or they like pretend to be FEMA. People come in from all over and you just don't, it's just like a mess. And I think that there are people who, um, they see those really chaotic moments as an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to either make money or like, the, I have a colleague at Grist who, she wrote a really scary story about the Oath Keepers, like the far right militia who they, uh, sometimes they'll show up and kind of fill the gaps that FEMA can't address. Mm -hmm. Like they'll be like, we, we have speedboats, you know, we'll go in and do flood rescue and they use it as like a recruiting tool. I wish you were here to tell you more, although it kind of keeps me up at night, so maybe not. But um, yeah, so there are definitely people who are weaponizing like those disaster moments, uh, like to, you know, people want to get out. And, you know, th there's also like hedge funds who they, they've, they'll go in after a storm and just like all cash offer for your home and then I'll turn around and rent it out and make money on it. But they, you know, and it's probably less than the home is worth, but people are just, they, they need it's to go. And so they'll, they'll take it, right? So yeah, there's people, those moments are, anybody can come, there's just a, such a wide like wedge that gets open for anybody to basically do whatever they want. And that's, it's really scary, yeah. So I have a question, there's two questions, but they're connected. What are you most hopeful about and what are you most worried about? Uh, E.g., our next president is a climate change. Is it? Cli <laughs> well, we'll just. Yeah. yeah what right, are you most yeah, yeah. worried about? There? I mean, I. I mean, without being too transparent about my view, like that's really concerning, right? Like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's and it remains unclear to me how much damage. I mean, a lot, obviously, but what would be rolled back? Like, there's obviously a lot of regulations that the EPA, et cetera, have done that those would be toast probably, but um, there's also quite like, there's a lot of movement on this. Um, and like even the big oil companies, like they were, they reconciled themselves to the Inflation Reduction Act because their business model has to some extent evolved where they now, they do carbon capture, they do hydrogen development, and they wanted those subsidies from the Inflation Reduction Act. And they're, <laughs> they and the Chamber of Commerce are now saying like, don't, don't get rid of that if you give that, you know, <laughs> let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. But it's very unpredictable yeah. when you have, I mean, those departments like DOE and EPA would be staffed by, who knows? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. like really, really uh, like ideologically extreme people probably. So that's concerning. Um, but I think the, the, something that like gives me hope, I mean, there's been a lot of movement on that. But also I think, I think that, um, this, the consensus among the, not necessarily people like elected officials, but people, regulators, and even the energy companies has shifted somewhat and there's no longer quite as aggressive of a denial of, you know, we can just do nothing about this. And like, to give an example, like there was this, um, in Oregon, there's this river called the Klamath River. It's really sacred to this Native American, several Native American tribes. And for decades, it's been dammed by these dams that, that Warren Buffett's, well, it, it wasn't him, but he now owns the dams. And they destroyed all the salmon. And for decades, you know, the tribe was like, please take these dams down. And they produce power, mm -hmm. right? So it makes money for Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company. And eventually in 2008, 2010, you know, Berkshire caved, you know, they were like, there's too much pressure. We're not making enough money on this. Like, it's just, let's just take them down. And they're gonna, they, they blew the first one up like mm. maybe two weeks ago. And the salmon, I mean, it's really hard to overstate how important this is. They've been fishing this for, since yeah. time immemorial, right? And they were almost 
toast, the salmon. They were almost completely extinct. And they're going to come back now. And so there's just kind of like the window of possibility has shifted somewhat, I think, over the past like five to 10 years. And it's really hard to move it back all the way. I mean, there, Trump will try, right? Like he said, like, I won't let their. I won't, I won't allow the sale of electric vehicles. It's like, that's not, but you know, that's like, you don't get to, you know, and people want them, right? Yeah. Including people in red states where now, like a lot of the investment from the Inflation Reduction Act is in Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, and those are good jobs that, that people there can now have thousands of, they don't want, you know, nobody wants that, right? So it's hard to do, you know? So yeah, that's kind of. It's yeah. interesting, yeah. okay. Hopeful. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be too Pollyanna. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for the education in this book. What influenced your capacity for bigger, deeper thinking um, with thoughtful att attention married with compassion? Well, um, well, mom, it was. You know, <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. I mean, I think. Yeah, well, my parents and grandparents are here, so that's the that's the answer. Is it was the four of them? Um, no, I think that what, <laughs> I think what attracted me to the topic is that it's so complicated and it's really difficult to talk about it in a in a black and white way, even though many people do. And as soon as you get into an issue, even one that seems as simple as like you know oil or something, like it's just full of really difficult nuance. And when you try to you know, something that as simple looks as, like, looks as simple as, like, your house is on the beach and the sea is right. crumbling. Why, why don't you leave? Like, you, you look in, it's like, it's just all really complicated. And that's what, you know, as a reporter, like, you just like complicated topics because they sustain your interest for longer. But, you know, then, um, you know, you, you, you end up sympathizing with people on all sides of an issue and you want to get in and really figure out how things work. And I guess, you know, to whatever extent I have the virtues that are described in that really kind card. Um, <laughs> it's because it's a really complicated topic. It's difficult to figure out. And that's what's, you know, you know, yeah. it, when you spend a lot of time with something pulling it apart, you end up with a lot, with an open mind, I think, about certain things. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, we were talking before about Florida, where I'm from, and right. many of you know that, and how my family has a restaurant that's on stilts and the water comes under it at high tide. And like, um, <laughs> And I love it. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, yeah. And so does my family. And I get down there and think, well, oh, hopefully this never goes away. And it, you know, the data are the data is it probably will, but we're still here. Yeah. There. Right. So. Right. Right. Um, yeah. More? Yeah, I think I've got one here. I'm from Michigan. We have the longest coastline in the country. Uh, my house is on Lake Michigan. With already, we've already experienced um, a ri see, rising, yeah, rising. And um, what is the prediction for more intense rising in the Lake Michigan? That's yeah. interesting. The, yeah, this is the, a really. It's, yeah. yeah, we don't. I don't think we know for sure. Like, but uh, my fiance's family is from uh, they in Wisconsin in Door County, and I would go there. Mm -hmm. in this, and in 2020, I went there, and the water was like up to the. And it was looking really bad. And then it went down again in 2022. It was like dried out. And it turns out that the reason for the fluctuation is that it just depends on how much of the ice uh, in Canada melts in a given year. And sometimes it'll come in and it'll really overwhelm. But it won't rise permanently, I don't think, in most places the way that it does in the Atlantic coast because the water, you know, the, the, when the ocean rises, it's because it expands because it's getting hotter and it's huge, right? So even because of the ocean, even tiny expansion creates like a foot of sea level rise. That won't quite happen, but they do think that because of like just fluctuations in the weather, you'll see a lot more uh, like uh, it's gonna be like a roller coaster, right? So some years it's gonna go all the way up, and then it could go back down. Um, and Chicago has had to deal with this, like the North Avenue Beach, uh, which is like a fake beach in Chicago that they built. It sometimes is just completely underwater, and then other times it's like twice as big as it should be. Um, and I don't know that there's been a serious effort to think about if this got a lot worse, what would it mean for like lakefront property, of which is quite a bit. Um, but that will, and I think it's just that the research just isn't quite there to know what it would look like in, you know, under 2.5 degrees or something. But it's not looking 
great, but you know, you're not going to see things, I don't think, like permanently go underwater and mm -hmm. it'll never go back down. But uh, I think there's still, the jury's out a little bit on that, on like okay. what the actual predictions look like, yeah. So watch Canada. Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. yeah. Jake, thank you so much. Thank you. This has fun. been just great. And you want to have it signed, please line up in a minute by the door in front of the table where he's going to be signing books. And to purchase The Great Displacement, Amy is at the table on the right in the back. Um, and make your purchase there and get in the line to have it signed. And please also visit, visit Marcia Schuyler, who's at the middle table, to, um, to about donations or to answer questions, ask questions. There, we have postcards, we're so excited. We have postcards that have all three events for next season that you can pick up and put on your refrigerator, like that's where you're supposed to put it. <laughs> and also take a look at the beautiful Crooked Steeple greeting cards made by Megan Close, artist and associate pastor. Thank you, Megan. Um, next season, I just wanna tell you real quickly, We'll be welcoming Meredith Hall, the author of the, author of the gorgeous novel, Beneficence. Some of you will remember that she was supposed to come last November and she had to cancel because of sickness and now she's better and she's very excited to come back. Um, and she, her story is about a family living on a farm in the lead up to the Second World War and it's stunning. I had to stop like at every third page to write down that sentence because I don't know how she did that. Um, and it, it's heartbreaking and inspiring, just like a really good novel should be. Um, in February, Amina Lukman Dawson will read from Free Water. And that was, it's the winner of the 2023 Newbery Medal. And it's an accessible, historical, middle grade novel which we hope that will, that will expand our audience to some younger people. Um, and Anne and I both read the book and all of us will enjoy hearing this story. It's beautiful. Um, finally in April, um, we welcome Catherine Ray, the author of The Berlin Letters, which is a novel about the female code breakers in the lead up to the, to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it's a fascinating story about family and survival. Um, so, Falls Church, Presbyterian Church, has been here for 150 years, and we have always been a place where we honored telling stories, um, sharing our stories with each other and listening for words to be inspired, for, to be a source of help and hope. And when we started Crooked Steeple, Anne and I really, it was incredibly important to us that this be free so that anyone could come. Um, we wanted to welcome people from all the different, our neighborhood and from all different neighborhoods in the, in the whole area. Um, the, ch the church has been incredibly supportive of in financially supporting us, and the Presbytery has given us a grant for the last two years that we keep hoping they do till the end of time. Um, we'll see how that goes, but um, we want to continue to keep it this way. We want it to be able to be free so that, um, we, we appreciate you making donations because that helps us to keep going. But you, just so you'll know when you tell other people about it, you can always come for free. You can always bring your friends and they don't have to donate. Um, now, if you move, feel moved to give us a lot of money, please see me or Anne directly because if we got a lot of money, more things are possible and we are completely ready for that, okay? <laughs> So anyway, blessings to each of you in this room. Thank you. Please join me in again thanking Jake for his presence.